from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. And good morning and welcome to Face the State. I'm Jay Cohn and we're joined today by former Montana U.S. Attorney Bill Mercer. We're here to talk about the legal issues, uh, not only here in Montana, but around the nation. Bill, thanks for joining us. Good morning, Jay. Yeah, always uh, fun to see you and uh, chat. I think this is like three or four years in a row now that we've uh, had Bill in to talk about the, the burning legal issues, those on the front burner and the back burner. Uh, for those of you who are uh, seeing Mr. Mercer for the first time, he is the past U.S. Attorney for Montana, uh, held that position from 2001 to 2009. He also held the Associate Attorney General's post under the Department of Justice, third in command under Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez. Do you ever hearken back to those days and uh, wish uh, things uh, you were still back there, or are you happy to be back in Montana? You know, uh, I love being part of the public policy world and the public service world, and I certainly miss it. But, uh, you know, watching it from afar right now, there's a degree of uh, craziness that I'm glad to be uh, uh, away from. So. But I, I certainly enjoyed my time. Yeah, less of a contact sport. Uh, Bill, <laughs> uh, practicing with Holland and Hart, 21 years in government service, and uh, he's a frequent face here on the Montana Television Network as we uh, use his uh, expertise to shed some light for our viewers on the various legal issues. You were also on TV this past year uh, representing uh, our new Congressman Greg Gianforte uh, after his uh, uh, assault case. I know you can't talk about that, but you might have seen Bill uh, I was going to ask you uh, on that overriding issue of whether booking photos are public documents. Can you shed I, any I light just, on that for us? I, I, I can't. I have a conflict there given my uh, representation of my clients. So that one's one I can't It's talk a about. sticky uh, wicket in the newsroom because some counties, uh, the booking photos are public documents, others they're not. And uh, maybe someday we'll get an overriding <laughs> ruling from one of these courts. Bill, let's talk first on the national scene. Uh, President Trump, a year in. Um, it's a, a story a day. And yeah, it kind of overshadows everything else. Yeah, you know, I thought an awful lot about the time that I spent in Washington and the fact that when you have what I'll describe as chaos, it tends to be the shiny object that takes the focus away from whatever the issue is and the storyline or the narrative that you're trying to establish. Whether you're in the executive branch or the legislative branch, it can just sort of commandeer all the energy. And it does really seem that that has happened to an extent that certainly was not, it wasn't common when I was back there that we would have that much drawn away based upon uh, a tweet or an issue that really, uh, I think, at some level is distracting from the focus. Now, you know, when we look back on, when political science look back on this in 10 years, it may be the conclusion that there was sort of a chaos theory and that was all by design and it worked reasonably well and the president was no less effective in terms of getting stuff done but as we're living in it right now it seems like it is more distraction than productive and you know i obviously as an alumnus of the department of justice I, i'm particularly interested in watching how those interactions have potentially affected the department of justice so you know uh, the idea that a president would be calling out the attorney general and essentially saying disparaging things about uh, his cabinet secretary, the chief federal law enforcement officer, that's uncharted. I mean, yeah, that's just we're not, in a new world, yeah. no doubt about it. Let's talk about the new world of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Neil Gorsuch uh, appointed by uh, President Trump and confirmed and now on the court. Has that shifted the court? more conservatively than we've seen in the past. What do you think? I think that's more of a hold seat, uh, but this was obviously one of the single most important things that happened at the end of the last conference, the last Congress, when uh, President Obama had appointed Judge Merrick Garland to the D.C. Circuit, and that uh, confirmation proceeding really didn't commence. And uh, so it gave President Trump an opportunity at the outset of the administration and I think f certainly for those on the right of center side of the political spectrum, this was a huge deal and one that has been celebrated and will continue to be celebrated because there would have been a tremendous shift in the court uh, from uh, the death of Justice Scalia to the appointment of Justice Garland. And by having someone who probably is much closer to Scalia, uh, I think it, it's 
you're not going to see much of a change. Kind of held the status yeah. quo of the court. Status quo is there, but it also means that if in the next three years the president has the opportunity to replace uh, one of the people that is to the left of, say, uh, Justice Roberts, then I think you could say that would that would be the potential for a very significant shift. I've said uh, on other broadcasts here that the court is sometimes described as a conservative court. I really take issue with that. I, I think it is more conservative than maybe it was in the 60s and 70s, but it's not a conservative court, and you see that on things like the, the decisions on the, on the Obamacare uh, that happened late in uh, the last presidential administration, and there are plenty of others. But if, you, if Justice Ginsburg or Justice Kennedy were replaced by someone close to where Justice Gorsuch is, it would be a big deal. Interesting to keep our eye on that as, as we move forward. Other big national stories, of course, the firing of James Comey as the FBI director, and uh, it remains to be seen uh, what uh, Robert Mueller's uh, tenure as the special investigator. Some people thought the president was going to fire him not too long ago. Uh, that seems to have calmed down, but who knows where this is going to end up. Yeah, no one except probably uh, Mr. Mueller, who I think probably at this point has amassed enough in the way of proof where he's got a pretty good idea about what the cooperators have said. Um, it'll be interesting to see if the president does sit down for an interview. Uh, and But a lot will be playing out in this year on that particular investigation. And whether it goes past 2018 is, I guess we'll get to find out. But it, the, the, certainly the firing of the FBI director is one of those things that was, you know, got a lot of attention. And it's hard to know whether the president really thought it would be something well received given how controversial the, the director's decisions had been leading up to the presidential election with respect to uh, first the, the recommendation, actually decision not to seek criminal charges of Secretary Clinton, but then also uh, what he said in leading up to the election in terms of what she had done and, right. and her culpability. Very controversial, but obviously uh, this was a firestorm and I don't think anyone, including the director, doubts the president's ability to uh, be terminated. He has the authority to hire and fire the FBI director, but uh, all the fallout afterwards. This is one of those questions about if he could do it all over again, is this one he would do? Because it certainly has been uh, a major distraction. And Jeff Sessions. The current attorney general seems to come under fire about every third week. Um, you think he's going to survive much longer? I guess anyone's guess. Right? I think we know exactly where that one's going. I think he's <laughs> going nowhere. Yeah. This is, I think, probably for him a job that he always thought, boy, I'd, I'd really like to be attorney general of the United States. I was a U.S. attorney. I uh, was in the Senate for a long time. I can bring an awful lot to that job. I think the president can probably say whatever he wants, and I don't, I don't think the attorney general's going anywhere. Speaking of uh, Jeff Sessions, uh, let's talk about uh, marijuana for just a second since uh, it was just in the news within the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. He apparently, uh, he did put out a statement directing, uh, uh, I guess, the Department of Justice, uh, U.S. attorneys. Uh, your read of that, exactly what did Sessions say and um, maybe help us wade through that a little bit. Well, I was interested in the statement because it felt very different than what uh, my boss, Attorney General Ashcroft, had done, w where there was always a lot of clarity on, you know, this is what the mission of the Department of Justice is, and these are my expectations, and I want you to go do this. This really was, I think, um, almost just sort of a statement of, you've got authority to do what's going to make sense in your particular jurisdiction, so go ahead and do that. There's not any real policy outcome in mind. It, it, you can't really say that's going to lead to more prosecutions of marijuana, possession, distribution, uh, production. And uh, I think here it's probably not going to have that much of an effect because we're part of the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit has interpreted a congressional appropriations writer to say that there are limits in terms of what U.S. attorneys in, in this part of the country can do. But I have already seen that the U.S. attorney in Boston has, much has sent a different message. And, uh, you know, this has been such a ping pong because we had uh, the last, the, the Obama administration essentially said if your conduct comports with state law, even though it may violate federal law, we're not going to do anything about it. Well, that was just on the medical marijuana side. Now that you have legalization, it's really changing the public policy issue. And so it'll be interesting to see how this 
rolls out around the country. I just don't know if we're ground zero. I don't think it's going to have probably much of a bite here. I read a couple of articles, maybe you did too, but they were saying perhaps Sessions' uh, statement was the uh, starting point to legalize marijuana across the country, that it might have been the uh, the kickstart for that. What do you Did you read those articles? I, I didn't, but I... I said it might have been the best thing for people uh, favoring the legalization that ever happened. It, 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 I suppose it could be. I think he would probably say you know, just the opposite. All I was saying is, I'm going to let the federal law enforcement people on the ground make decisions that they think make sense in their jurisdiction. But at the end of the day, this is really, um, I'm kicking that to them, and I'm certainly not doing anything other than suggesting states have autonomy to do what they're going to do, and I want my people to sort of exercise their authority uh, consistent with that. But it, I, I guess I will say that if for people that have been on the side of marijuana is dangerous, we want to send a clear message, we want to make sure people understand it's against federal law. This is a little bit of a, a murkiness uh, that I think may contribute to the idea that, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal. So I, I guess in that respect, uh, it probably isn't as strong a message as we have had uh, from past DOJ, certainly before the Obama era. Let's talk, uh, you were mentioning some personnel changes uh, in the Department of Justice uh, here in Montana. Uh, Kurt Almy, our new uh, U.S. Attorney. Uh, we're familiar with uh, Kurt here in the Billings area, but uh, your assessment of, uh, I mean, he's hit the ground running, already been confirmed. Uh, looks like a great selection for that post. Ooh, I probably should say I have a conflict of interest there, too, because uh, I've known him oh, since come he was on. 15 he's years old. He's a good old. guy, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, he is as qualified, he's more qualified to do this job than anyone in the state and and probably as qualified as anyone in the country uh, I think he'll do a fantastic job. Michael Cotter our former US attorney was uh, terminated along with all the rest yep. of uh, you know, must have been over 60 I can't remember the number but uh, that seemed to get a lot of traction at the time and um, maybe that's just the way the uh, ball rolls in this day and age that we live in. Yeah I I remember that there was talk at the time that this was controversial. Well, that was a full 90 days into the Trump administration. And it is true that there are some administrations, including the Obama administration, that sort of allowed people to stay in place until they were replaced. But this is different in every administration. And a lot of times presidents say, I want to get my, career, my team in place. It's going to be faster. If I've got those people out of office, I've got the career folks stepping in on an interim basis and an urgency to get my team in place. So I, I don't think there was anything unusual about that in the least. Uh, we have a new uh, Supreme Court justice in Montana. Um, District Judge Ingrid Gustafson here in uh, Yellowstone County was appointed to uh, fill out the, the term of, uh, help me out here, uh, Mike, Mike Wheat. Mike Wheat. Yep. I'm sorry, uh, yep. he's uh, retiring. Um, you think that's a big deal? She's the first... Uh, uh, justice uh, from eastern Montana, at least the Billings area, since Diane Barr's back in the 80s, I believe. Yeah, it, it, maybe even more like 90s. Okay. But yeah, I mean, uh, I do think it's a big deal because the court has not had many eastern Montana members. If you reach back over my lifetime, it, you can almost count all these people in one hand. You know, it's sort of Gulbranson and McDonough and Sheehy and Barr's. Uh, and so I think particularly given how significant in terms of population this district is in Billings and the fact that really the criminal docket and the drug court and all of the perspectives that Justice Gustafson will bring, uh, it, it's good to have some geographic diversity, I think. And so uh, it's noteworthy uh, in addition to her long service in the district court before her right. selection. Right. If you're just joining us here on Face the State on this uh, Sunday, Bill Mercer, former uh, U.S. Attorney for Montana, is our guest, a frequent uh, legal uh, analyst on the Montana Television Network. Uh, Bill also used to uh, work with the Department of Justice, the Associate Attorney General under uh, Alberto Gonzalez. So uh, uh, we are picking his brain a little bit about the hot uh, legal issues in Montana. So we covered kind of the national scale there. Let's move to uh, uh, big sky country. And uh, one of the big things that we were talking about just prior to taping is just the increase in violent crime that we're seeing in Montana, and just horrendous crimes, beheadings, dismemberments, uh, a majority of which can be tied to the uh, terrible, terrible problem of methamphetamine as it ma makes its way through our society. Yep. I, I, 
I think it is, this year seemed to really be a tipping point in that regard. It's not as if we haven't had serious violent crime. We have, and we've talked about some right. of those things in, in the past. But I think it was the frequency and, and maybe the egregiousness of the conduct that was shocking. And uh, uh, we've been looking at the number of officer-involved shootings. Uh, and and it's, it's in Great Falls, it's in Missoula, it's in Billings. Uh, so the violent crime problem in the state is uh, growing. It is definitely being driven by meth, which um, we may not have time to talk about, but you know, it's one of those things where we've been in a battle with it for a long time. I think through the meth project and, and other initiatives. And we thought we'd maybe turn the corner yeah, on it. We thought we, thought we were going to drive demand down, and there was good, good data to support that. But that demand is clearly picked up. The foster care placements are back up, and the violence related to it is there. And every, you know, when, when viewers have a chance to see those horrific stories, the probability that meth is going to be in that picture somewhere is pretty high. So, um, scary situation for everyone involved in public safety and uh, for folks in, in neighborhoods where all of a sudden they're, uh, they're seeing stories play out on TV that where the, right. the victims are right in their backyard. And we've had, uh, you mentioned the one incident, uh, one time in Billings where just a few months ago we had up to 11 police officers who were on administrative leave yeah. for their involvement in uh, shootings that were still um, part of the protocol in the department. They just couldn't, couldn't work, so that obviously puts the pressure on those on on the streets. And, and then, you know, uh, the the randomness of the events, the highway patrol officer and uh, not high, excuse me, the deputy county sheriff in Broadway, Broadway right. County, Mason Moore, who was assassinated doing his job. Um, so it's it's a big. I wish we could have a conversation about well, what do we do about this? But certainly a big part of what we need to do about it is figure out what we do with meth. Um, another big issue in Montana: Marcy's law passed by the voters and then ruled unconstitutional. Um, give us a little history here, and I know you were uh, somewhat involved in helping push Marcy's Law to give uh, the victim of crime more rights. Yeah, I, I think this uh, was an interesting development. Ultimately, the court uh, concluded that this wasn't uh, constitutional. So the voters, uh, having secured enough signatures to put this on the ballot, it passed, I think, about two to one. Uh, and then the ACLU and others said um, this is an unconstitutional enactment by the voters and, and the court agreed with that. Um, so we talk about the public policy side of it first. I think part of the debate there, uh, there is a conflict of views. I think some people believe that we've got plenty uh, of coverage under Montana law for victims of state crimes. Uh, some of us, and I'll put myself in that category, don't really think that's right. Uh, then there was a lot of conversation about this is really going to be very costly and expensive, and I think a mm -hmm. lot of municipalities and counties uh, were very concerned about that. Ultimately, none of that really mattered because the court looked at it and said, we think the, the way it was uh, structured uh, was not something that the voters could adopt this scope of constitutional change in this one single initi constitutional initiative, and so we're going to throw it out. And I think time will tell uh, whether, what this is going to do to the initiative process, uh, uh, the constitutional right. amendment process by initiative. Uh, there are certainly those that think that by saying uh, there were multiple issues that were getting done as part of this one constitutional revision, and that with the multiplicity of issues, the public couldn't lawfully adopt it. It'd be interesting to see if that has an impact on whether that sort of direct democracy that we have in the Constitution is going to be impeded by that. So, uh, Couldn't this have been determined before people voted on it? Because it goes through a uh, review by the Attorney General's office yes. and um, I know sometimes in the world of, of politics that we live in they'll let it go if they think there's a problem but I've never really seen that. Yeah. You know, mostly they're, they're in doing it in good faith. It could have been caught early rather than have people vote on it and now be frustrated and maybe, you know, undermine our uh, constitutional initiative process. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a good question. And I, I think that after people have a chance to really stew on that, the, the, what the court's done, 
be interesting to see if it chills the enthusiasm for trying to get the Constitution amended, because obviously the only other way we can do that is if we have a Constitutional Convention. Um, and that's unlikely to happen, I think. So um, we'll see where it goes. Interesting. Looking back on some of the other uh, big stories, let's talk about the John Krakauer case that uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, celebrated author uh, with uh, his book, uh, Rape in a College Town, yes, uh, focusing on the University of Montana, but really focusing on this case that represented all campuses in America and this terrible problem. Uh, now, specifically in this case, he is seeking the uh, Commissioner of Higher Education's records mm -hmm. so he can determine how they determined uh, or how they proceeded in this uh, Jordan Johnson rape case at the University of Montana. Where does it stand now? It's kind of back to the district court, right, after all this Yeah, stuff. and I think it is about ready. In fact, maybe it's already on its way back to the Supreme Court because uh, the Supreme Court had argument in this case and sent it back to the district court to say, we want you to actually look at the records and decide whether the, the privacy interest in the student whose records we're talking about uh, is more significant than the public's right to know. The district court in Helena, Judge Menahan, looked at those records after uh, the court sent it back to the district court and concluded that the records could be released. He thought that there should be some things that were redacted. Right, but okay. in general, if his ruling stands, Krakauer is going to get those records. I imagine that, that the uh, commissioner uh, will go back to the Supreme Court because it was pretty clear from the oral argument that at least one, if not two, members of the court sort of didn't really see how these things could be released under any circumstances given the federal statute that governs student records. So I don't think it's over yet, but now it's going to play out in the backdrop of what Secretary DeVos is going to do on the whole question of how is she going to revise the letter that went out to all campuses that really started much of this conversation okay. because of the change in the in the standard that universities need to apply when there's an allegation of sexual assault. So I think Krakauer may be on his way to another book once he gets these records because <laughs> then he can talk about what Secretary DeVos is up to too. So. We'll look forward to that. I think it'll be called Into the Wild 2 or something. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll look for that. We, that apparently is going back to the Supreme Court. And uh, I just, the, I think the commissioner is going to continue to fight this yeah. uh, for as long as he can, and we'll see. Um, Michael Spell, uh, this is the uh, horrendous uh, Sherry Arnold uh, murder case out of Sydney from 2012. You were pointing that out. Yes. How long ago that seems? Yeah. Uh, five years now, and that case, uh, bring us up to speed on that. So. Spell uh, and his team put forth a pretty spirited defense in the district court trying to get the case essentially flipped into a civil proceeding, arguing that A, he wasn't competent to stand trial, uh, that his, he didn't have the capacity to understand the charges to assist in his own defense. Judge Simonton had rejected those arguments uh, and Spell went ahead and pled guilty, but then he reserved his rights as part of the guilty plea to go to the Supreme Court make those same sort of arguments. The court has now heard those and rejected them uh, and also uh, concluded that the punishment wasn't cruel and unusual and that it was pr appropriate for him to go to a prison as opposed to uh, a, a, a mental health facility. So uh, that case is finally over after, after five years. And, well, yeah, uh, nearly so. six years now since we're in 2018. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I guess, the, the time it takes for justice to be served in a high-profile, complicated case like they all seem to be. In yeah, this case. you know, when the death penalty is potentially on the table, that changes the dynamic of how quickly it's going to move. It certainly slowed it down, and uh, and then there were a lot of continuances before the briefing was finally done. But the case is, is over. Uh, how many times did we call you in to <laughs> We've talked about it at least interview times about this case and the latest uh, <laughs> twist. Um, Another part of the notes on what to talk about, legislative action on sexual assault in Montana. Sexual assault obviously now really in the, 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 focal, uh, the focus for all our society. Mm -hmm. um, the legislature of Montana took some action in the last session in 2017 that you said really was surprisingly not controversial. To fill us in. Yeah, there was an interim committee uh, that focused, that actually the Montana legislature in 2017 did a whole lot of things in terms of sentencing, 
But this piece was focused really on what do we do to make it so the burden of proof is, is not quite as challenging for prosecutors given the definition of consent. And it was the work of the interim committee that led to the changes that the legislature took up in 2017. And I thought that there might be sort of a spirit of debate saying, you know, we, after years of having the definition of consent be this, uh, why are we changing it? But in fact, it flew through the legislature. It wasn't the least bit controversial, broad bipartisan support. Uh, and I think the county attorneys around the state believe that it will be uh, easier to bring cases because of the change in that definition of consent. So it's, it, uh, you know, it's these cases, as we've said many times, are very difficult cases. If we have uh, a victim that says, I was raped, and a perpetrator who says it was consensual, this definition is not going to make the difference. Those are still going to be hard cases. But there are plenty of other instances where the, the way the statement has come in from the victim uh, has potentially made it harder. And I think this, this definitional change in consent uh, and the context of the crime may be helpful. A couple minutes to go. Anything we haven't touched on that you wanted to? We're 2018. This is an election year. Um, we'll be interested to to see how that uh, plays out down the road. Anything uh, come to mind that we should be keeping our uh, uh, focus on? Well, I do think that uh, we talked a little bit about the Gorsuch confirmation. And I think uh, on the legal side, as people listen to the senatorial debate in 2018, both in this state and all over the country, the, the balance of the Supreme Court is going to end up being a fairly significant issue. Um, and I think it it would have been significant if we didn't have this kind of Obama Garland, Trump Gorsuch history, but we, uh, we have that history, and people are going to use this as a real battle cry to fire up their respective bases, and for both sides to say, here's why it's really important for you to get out and vote in this election, and uh, so in a sense, that legal issue I think may have. A, a real, uh, a real effect in the, terms. The of treatment of Merrick Garland's uh, appointment is going to have coattails for years to come. We believe, and when in that the the Senate under the Republican leadership refused to take that up, uh, and the, the the history shows us that. Uh, careful what what you do because it might come back to haunt you. Yeah, you know it's interesting because I think Senator McConnell was able to use what had happened. I think it was called the Biden precedent, maybe. Or right. Something. That that was his argument. I think that if, yeah, there's so many different permutations, but if you change it and say, all right, let's say we've got Republican president, Democrat Senate, what will happen to a potential nominee, um, and. All bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a new world we're living in. And I think another thing to watch is, um, you, you know, back to sort of the difficulty, uh, the, the strain and stress of this last year in terms of governance. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting thing to watch, not so much legal, but on the policy side, about how the president's going to build out the executive branch as you get into year two exactly. and years three and four. Because um, it, it's it's not easy work, and uh, it's certainly not easy work if the commander in chief is is saying I don't like what you're doing, and that's happened to a couple of the people in my former agency. Right. So we'll see how many people uh, have their hands in the air. Bill Mercer, our guest here on Face the State, offering us his expertise on the the legal world we're living in these days. Bill, happy New Year to you. Have a good Thanks, 2018. Steve. I'm sure we'll see you down the road. Uh, same to you to our viewers this morning here on Face the State. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again soon.